Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If I can have your attention, please, I think we will go ahead and get uh, started with our program today. Uh, my name is Ken Odie. I'm head of the Department of Animal Sciences and Industry at uh, Kansas State University. And on behalf of the department, welcome. We're delighted that you have uh, decided to join us at Cattlemen's Day and uh, take advantage of what we think is an outstanding program. Uh, I want to take just a moment and share a few thoughts with you about uh, the Department of Animal Sciences and Industry at K-State. We have a long history here of serving uh, students and the livestock industry. Uh, and uh, I want to share just a little bit about uh, some things that are going on in the department. Number one is uh, we're at an all-time high for students uh, in this department at Kansas State University. Our official fall enrollment was 1,197 students. Uh, we're up about 500 students in the last uh, seven years. So uh, the, the students that are uh, interested in animal science are coming here and uh, we're delighted to have them. It's, uh, it's added a lot of workload to our faculty, but we have outstanding faculty and we're very appreciative of the work uh, that they do. We also, uh, believe very strongly that uh, a major obligation that we have is being the source of quality, uh, unbiased information uh, for the livestock, meat, and food industries. And that's part of what we're about here today. It's not only bringing our research and the products of our research to folks like you, but it's also bringing you uh, outstanding information from, uh, from people here at Kansas State and actually uh, outside of Kansas State. Uh, I want to share just a little bit about uh, the program. If you look at your program here today, uh, we have an outstanding morning session with uh, uh, Dr. Glenn Tonser, Dr. Ted Schroeder, who uh, are, are the best in the business uh, in the area that uh, we're uh, asking them to work with you on today and uh, bring information to you today. And then I'm also especially delighted that we have with us today uh, Paul Clayton. Uh, Paul. Uh, works for the Meat Export Federation and is, uh, works uh, every day in the issues of uh, exporting meat to, from the U.S. to countries around the world and I think will bring us some very uh, relevant information as we look at this, uh, this expanding uh, global population and what it means for uh, industries like ours. Uh, after lunch today, we have a, we have a series of speakers uh, that you can see in your program. I'd encourage you to take advantage of those sessions. Uh, we do have a new feed mill uh, at Kansas State University. Uh, we dedicated that feed mill uh, in October of last fall. Uh, it's a joint project between the Department of Green Sciences and Industry, which houses our feed science program, and the Department of Animal Sciences and Industry where we have a large uh, effort uh, in the area of animal nutrition. Uh, we are going to be having tours uh, of the feed mill uh, this afternoon. Dr. Charles Stark, who uh, we hired uh, uh, last summer, came on board to really lead the feed science program and is, is doing an outstanding job in that area. So I would encourage you to actually take advantage of that. Uh, later this afternoon, we will be having our annual uh, uh, bull and female sale uh, from our purebred beef unit. Uh, this will be at the new Stanley Stout Center, which is, uh, uh, if you haven't been up to the Stanley Stout Center, which is uh, north of Kimball and east of Denison, uh, just to the northeast of us, uh, uh, probably uh, pretty much straight north of us uh, up the road a ways, so we encourage you to get to that. Uh, at 3.15 today, before the start of that sale, we will be doing some uh, recognition and uh, namings of some additional uh, components of the Stanley Stout Center, so we invite you to that event as well. Uh, and the last thing I want to do is our, our moderator this morning is Dr. Lindsay Hulbert. Uh, Lindsay joined us uh, from uh, uh, University of California at Davis uh, just about a year ago now. She has her degrees, including a PhD from Texas Tech University. Uh, training is animal behavior and physiology, uh, teaching uh, and doing research in animal behavior, stress physiology, and Lindsay will be moderating our morning session. So uh, with that, Lindsay, I turn the podium over to you. Thank you, Dr. Odie. Good morning. Um, I'm very happy to uh, be the moder moderator today. Um, so this morning, we're going to welcome, first welcome Glenn Tonser and Ted Schroeder. 
Um, they're both uh, professors um, in ag economics. Glenn is an expert in, cattle, in the cattle industry and economical issues. And Dr. Schroeder specializes in grain and livestock uh, price analysis. Today we are looking forward to our discussion on the economic challenges revolving around zolpaterol, antibiotic restrictions, and then further uh, future possible restrictions that might uh, affect the beef industry. So with that, I would like to welcome uh, both of our speakers up to the podium. Well, thank you, Lindsay. Um, it's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, you are going to get a tandem version of this uh, from Ted and I, as we did last year. Uh, I, at least, always look forward to this, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come back. Uh, I want to take the opportunity, uh, this comes with having the mic for a second, to do a 30-second sidebar. Uh, and I'll ask Shelby Hill to raise her hand. There's a student in the middle of the room here. Uh, Shelby is a grad student in our Ag Econ department who's working on her thesis on a host of stalker production, uh, price, and animal performance risk issues. Uh, I'm highlighting that because it's of interest to you guys, but very narrowly, we would love for you to fill out a very short survey. Uh, if you would spend five minutes with her after this or during the lunch break, I had her raise her hand for a reason. Uh, give her a couple minutes of your time. We'd appreciate that. So with that being said, uh, the game plan, while Ted and I have the control up here, is we're going to give you some remarks about the current situation market outlook update. Um, I will try to lead that, and Ted can interject and correct me as he sees fit as we go. Uh, and then I'll hand it over to Ted to kind of lead a discussion on uh, economic issues as it relates to technology use, adoption, uh, requests from the public, uh, and parallels on uh, regulatory oversight. And then I will take the liberty to interject when he's doing that as well. So hopefully you'll enjoy that and get a lot from this. I will tell you, uh, these slides are available online. Our very last slide will show you how to find those. So you're welcome to take as many notes as you want, but anything you see, you'll have access to later. So you don't have to write down every number. Most of you know I like to kind of start with a very broad overview, uh, simply before I lose 10 of you. I try not to be boring, but every Outlook talk kind of does a little bit of that. Uh, and I think it's important to highlight, again, I have two hands as an economist, what the supply side is and the demand side is, and how that really gets you to this current hot situation I would call our current industry to be in. On the supply side, we have a continued pull down in the overall industry size. Everybody in this room knows that, right? We have historically tight calf crop numbers. Keep reaffirming that, right? Breeding herds, very low, all those kind of things. We'll talk about expansion briefly, but that is a huge underpinning from a fundamental economist perspective of what's going on today. Even more narrowly than that, I think it's important to recognize feed yards and aggregate are pretty current in their marketings. And that's one of the reasons you've had the run up, particularly in January, but more broadly since the year started in fed cattle prices. We had a tight supply and then you had a very current marketing situation that made that even hotter, right, for throughout most of 2014 so far. When you flip over to the demand side things, uh, Ted and I actually had the opportunity along with Jim Minert, my predecessor here that most of you remember who's now at Purdue, uh, to do a project this past year for the beef board. Uh, so that was your checkoff funded uh, money at work, looking at beef demand issues, trying to project forward what we think are the key drivers, issues that should be prioritized for beef demand. Are we okay? You want me to hold it closer? Okay. I can sit on it if need be, if you can't hear me outside. All right, is that better? Okay, that's fine. Uh, the key punchline I wanted to highlight is, and we're not here to give a sole beef demand talk, but it's important to recognize we don't only have a tight supply and supportive supply situation on prices, we also have a stable, if not strong, beef demand environment in many ways. That's the key point I want to get across. We can talk about that more if you like. Our next speaker is going to speak a lot about exports, and the whole issue of export demand is quite critical. You add all that up, right, everything I've showed you right there is pretty supportive. The industry isn't, you know, void of risk. I don't want to come across as naive on that, but there's a lot of good things going on that gives us the current record high prices and a lot of the excitement that cow-calf producers, stocker producers, and more recently even feedlot operators have had. So 2014 is starting off and looks quite good. So that's the broad overview. I don't want to belabor all these points, uh, but this bar chart should get anybody in the room that's a cow-calf operator quite excited, right? The left-hand side is dollars per cow. These are returns over cash cost for a representative Southern Plains operation. And you should see that the scale on this chart has changed, right? Left to right is years, right, down on the uh, horizontal axis, going back to 1986. If you look at 2013, so we're now looking backwards to last year, per this estimate, we come up with about $130 estimated return over cash cost, which is a pretty good year historically when you look back over time. 2004, 2005 was slightly better, but 2013, in a historic sense, was a good year for the typical cow-calf producer. 
There's lots of regional variation behind that, but looking at the industry as a whole, it was a good year. If you look at the last two bars, 2014 and 2015 are projections, and those numbers are $350 and change, depending on exactly you know, when you look at it, projections for the next two years returns. How do we have that optimistic of a projection? Well, quite simply, right? Input costs have come down notably. Again, there's some regional pockets, you can't say that, but in aggregate for the country, cost side of being a cow-calf operator has improved a lot, and calf prices are higher. It doesn't take somebody with a PhD to recognize if both main legs of that margin are improving, you start pushing up expectations on cow-calf margins, right? That's the main story there. A key question that lots of us are talking about, right, and we have focused discussions on, is is that improved margin sufficient to pull the trigger on expansion, right? And there's lots of debates about how much will expand and whether or not those wheels of motion are at play. The most recent estimate we have is the January cattle inventory report, which NAS puts out every year. And effectively, that said, yes, there is a small increase in heifer retention. So the industry in aggregate is trying to pull the trigger on expansion. It's important to put in there that most analysts, like myself, were expecting a little bit more heifer retention than showed up in that report. So I would, if you just take that report and pause for a second, I think the industry is trying to expand, but maybe a little slower than some people thought. And that's because a lot of producers are uh, conservative by nature. You know, there's key pockets such as Oklahoma today where the weather conditions may not be as good as we'd like them to be. There's a lot of things that might slow the ability to expand. But I do think we've started the process of trying to expand the herd. And then for some context, it always comes up is, okay, so yes, we're going to try to expand. Second would be how much are we going to try to expand? How large will this industry become maybe? And I always like to share this 10-year projection that USDA ERS puts out and effectively the number that's up here on the slide is in February, they put out their most recent projection for the year 2023. So that's 10 years out there, long run numbers here, estimating the US beef cow herd would be 33.7 million head. And for context, that would be 16% higher than the numbers we have for 2012. So if you wanna you know, synthesize that down, I think we're starting to expand the herd. It takes a long time to expand the herd. We're doing a little slower than some people thought. And in aggregate, we might get 15, 16% larger herd than we have today 10 years from now, okay? So that's kind of the state of the union on that, if you like, okay? If you go to our Ag Manager website, which if you don't, I encourage you to make use of that. There's a lot of good information there uh, that's automatically updated every night. Uh, comes up with lots of price forecasts that I encourage you to make uh, use of. Uh, this is one of the resources that's there, the specific links at the bottom of this page. But narrowly what this is, is you can find three parallel charts to this where we're putting out projections basically for the next four months for three different weights of steers, 550, 650, and 750, for three different auction markets in Kansas. I'm simply showing you one of those for 750 pounders, right, for the next four months. You can read the numbers, but effectively over the next four months, uh, futures market-based, basis-adjusted forecast, that's what these are, is expecting upper 160s, low 170 prices for 750 pound steers. The deeper point I want you to do is make sure you're aware of this and use it. I always include the, uh, these in my Outlook talks, not because I want you to memorize the number, but because I want you to make use of internet connections when you have it, either in your own operation or somewhere else, and get this information because you don't see us all the time. It's on the web and it's automatically updated, so take use of that, make use of it. Okay, when you flip over to the stocker side of things, uh, it's not just the cow-calf sector that has a reason to be optimistic. Uh, I think there's a lot of reason to be optimistic for stockers as well. Um, in a longer term historical sense, we have pretty high values of gain being signaled by the market. Now that varies a lot depending on exactly what weight class and what time you make those assessments, kind of like it always has for stockers. But I think there's definitely some opportunities in the market there. Uh, the cost of gain side of being a stocker or backgrounder is also improved for similar reasons that it has for cow-calf operators. So, I mean, again, value of gain stable if not strong, cost of gain going down, that helps those margins. And I'd like to call your attention to yet another resource that's always available to you uh, to basically project these values of gain when you don't come to events like this, right? When you go home and you want to do a different hypothetical for your background in operation or stocker operation, make use of this, the websites in the middle of this slide. And all I did was include two particular examples uh, using the Salina market, which I always do just so I know which market I'm pulling this from in these examples. Uh, you could do a hypothetical like this coming Monday, I want to buy or either just continue to background a 700 pounder and I plan to put 50 more pounds on before I sell it, right? That's one hypothetical you could use this resource for, and you want to figure out if it's worth it, right? It's a market signaling, I should put those extra 50 pounds on, given my own cost information I have at home, or should I just sell it today, or in this case next Monday, for 700 pounds? Well, use this resource and you come up with a projected value of gain of those 50 pounds in that scenario in Salina of 139, 
which is quite high for somebody that's in that situation, somebody that has that 700 pounder they're doing that evaluation on. Doesn't fit everybody, but that's an example of using that resource. Look out to this fall, right? Again, somebody, maybe it's a cow-calf operator that's entertaining the backgrounding uh, retention notion. You could have a 550-pound steer, say, the middle of September, and you're thinking about keeping it and putting 200 pounds on, selling around Christmas. Currently, the expected value gain for that hypothetical is $113 per hundred weight. So you can compare that with your own cost side and make that decision. I mainly want to call your attention to value of gain is all over the board in the 105 to 130 range, depending on the scenario you look at. But there's resources available to you all the time, so make use of it. Round this out when you look at the feedlot side of things. Uh, we've had notable improvement in the last three months, as most of you probably recognize. Uh, we're coming out of a couple years of bad red ink for the typical feed yard, so this is some welcome improvement. I won't give my full spiel on excess capacity, um, but I do think it's part of my job to remind the industry that we still have a structural challenge. Uh, we have too much concrete bunk space relative to the calf crop in North America. Um, I don't want us to lose sight of that with the most recent uh, improvement returns. I'm not trying to be a bear, just my job to kind of remind you of that. Uh, we haven't resolved it. And if you want some specific numbers on returns, uh, Kevin Duvetter, another colleague in AgiCon department, many of you know, uh, works with me and we monthly put out these projections. Uh, basically use focus on feedlot information from the animal science and industries department uh, to give us some animal performance information over time, couple that with the price environment that we see, and we benchmark what we think profitability has been and attempt to project basically the next five months. That's what's up on here. Uh, the specific numbers, uh, January closeouts we estimated were positive returns of 127 much better than anything I've been able to talk about for a couple of years, right? Notable improvement there. The main thing underneath that was a rally in fed cattle price in January, right? Relative to what was expected when those feeder steers were purchased uh, five months earlier. The rest of that chart there, or the table actually, uh, you can get in a PDF we put out every month, but the summary would be is closeouts in February, we think we're better yet. I say think, because I don't have all the animal performance information from Focus on Feedlot yet. I know the market prices, I don't know the performance stuff yet, but we estimate maybe $170 return, so February was even better. Uh, here in March, 110, and then maybe some fall off, mainly because the summer live cattle contracts haven't kept up with the more nearby, and most of you probably recognize that. And the way we do these price projections is it's futures market based, so the summer markets aren't as strong as more recently, so that shows up in pinching these projected feedlot returns. My last numbers, and I don't expect any of you to read these. Again, you can get the numbers later. The arrows are the story I care about here. Uh, LMIC puts out quarterly projections uh, basically for the next two years. And here in 2014, we're expecting a 6.5% pull down in commercial slaughter. Again, that's just a reflection of constantly pulling down calf crops, right? That's just you know, basically that coming to bear. Narrowly for the second quarter, a 7.3% reduction of year-over-year -year supply. That's what we keep talking about on the you know, supply side of this being very tight. The middle column is average dressed weights. So the industry has a long history of increasing dressed weights, trying to slightly mitigate the pull down number of animals. So that's why that arrow is going up. But the far right, the arrow is going down because in aggregate, we have a lot fewer hooves that we're not offsetting with more dressed weight poundage gain. So we're having a pull down in beef production. None of that's really new, but the magnitude of it here in 2014 is higher than we're used to. So a 6.2% reduction in beef that's expected to be produced here in the U.S. in 2014 is a notably larger pull down than we're used to talking about. And then the trend in 2015 is more of the same, just not quite as stark, right? That's the broad summary of that side of this. This slide is the parallel information that LMIC puts out that's the cattle prices that go with that. Um, given those expected changes in volumes, what are the prices? Uh, the first thing you'll see there is the five market average for fed cattle. Here in 2014, we're looking at a 15% increase in the first quarter, which now, of course, is two-thirds realized, right? And the price range they have there is 144, 145, mainly reflects the run-up we had in January and for the most part held since then. I'll call your attention to the fact that current forecasts have the high for 2014 to be set in the first quarter. Uh, time will tell if that's the case, but many analysts, including LMIC that pulls this together, uh, were kind of surprised at the strength of the market early in 2014. And when we look at 2014, we may have already set the high for fed cattle prices. Look out to 2015, basically a little bit more uh, expansion on fed cattle prices is expected, but not as much as we were talking about before, again, because we started 2014 off so much hotter, right? I mean, a little bit uh, pessimism about the ability to keep that up, if you like. The far right is uh, different, two different weight series and prices for Southern Plains steers. I will simply make the passing comments about the five to six weights. Uh, here for the year of 2014, uh, projecting low twos. 203 to 210 is the price range that's up there. All right? You can 
compare that with what's going on today, and you might call that a little bit pessimistic. Uh, but when you look quarter to quarter, effectively the second quarter of 2014, we're expecting to be the high within that particular series. And we look out to the fall, expecting to come down maybe below two bucks. Um, time will tell if that holds. But even at those numbers, those are historically high numbers that support the $300, $350 positive returns that were in that cow-calf bar chart that I started to talk off with. Okay. My last two slides talk about, uh, real briefly, beef demand um, and actually the intersection of beef price with the beef offerings uh, that we're putting out there because I think there's a lot of confusion on that and I think it's a decent segue over for Ted. The green star on this particular figure is a what if, right? So I want to kind of clarify what's underneath that star to walk you through this lesson. Pounds per capita is what's on the horizontal part of this chart and you can see it spans from 55 pounds, this is retail beef, per capita all the way to 73. And then vertically, this is the dollars per pound, and more narrowly, that's the all fresh retail price per pound. You can see the 2013 number, the far top left, we were at about 470, right? And we had 50, roughly six pounds per capita, right? That was consumed in 2013. The deeper trend, if you compare that to the cluster of years, where we had many years where we were in the 65 to 67, 68 pounds, right, in that upper $3 crowding $4 arena, lots of years there. And for the last several years, we've been moving further to the left, right, pounds per capita comes down, and we've been moving the price up, okay? Everybody follows that. That simply reflects the industry's been shrinking in terms of number of animals, right? Less animals, less pounds, that's what's going on there. The million dollar question that keeps coming up, right, <laughs> is just how high will the industry be able to push retail prices in 2014? The green star I've put up there, corresponds with 53 pounds per capita, right? So that's the production and therefore effectively the consumption number here in the US that ERS is projecting for 2014. Vertically, I've put it at 529 because that would be the number, that's the price per pound, the all fresh beef price per pound, that if we have 53 pounds per capita would tell me that beef demand was flat in 2014 to 2013. In other words, given that reduction in production and therefore consumption, that's the price increase that has to occur for me to come to you and say beef demand was flat or it held its own, held the gains we had in 2013. If 550 is realized, I'll be sitting here saying beef demand was stronger in 2014. If $5 is realized, I'll be sitting here saying 2014 beef demand fell, right? So that's an indifference point if you like, right? It's a projection going forward and what the industry has to accomplish. I think that's important. Uh, that number would be 7% higher than the number we had that 529 is a 7% increase in the retail beef price. In January, that all fresh beef price went up 6.8%. So we didn't quite hit that mark, but I highlight that because that price went up more than most people thought it could or would, all right? So there's a partial success story in that. To date, I'm actually more optimistic on beef demand than a lot of other people, is those that remain interested in purchasing beef have been paying the higher prices. Now they might ask more questions, which I think is what Ted might talk about in a minute, but I'm cautiously optimistic on this but it's very important to recognize the direction of what's going on. So with that, Ted, I will uh, hand over control to you. And you didn't interject on me, but that, that won't keep me from interjecting. Fair, fair game. Uh, well done. I, I saw nothing that I could contribute or disagree with there, Glenn. I'm going to shift from numbers more to philosophy here for a bit, but you should be pretty happy, and I'm, I'm pretty sure your local pickup dealer is going to be happy in about a year as well. Um, it's nice to have the tide turned a bit, especially those in the cow-calf sector who have been on the opposite side of this thing at times and facing low returns. But when we're in these kinds of arenas and when we're in today's world and environment, it's not the time to get complacent. You know that. And we have in the midst of us, as we always do, challenges surrounding. And this one, this, the storm that's brewing here now, and it, and it really has already started, the, the clouds are already starting to, to, to come in as actually something other than just clouds. The, the storm itself is there. Surrounds our uses of technology in the industry. And we're gonna focus here just a little bit for a few minutes on especially the technologies around antibiotics and what's happening in that arena and talk through a little bit with you some of the economic implications of some of what's happening in that arena. 
maybe make you at least think a little about how we might navigate through this sector. Now, the issue around antibiotics and technology in general, other growth enhancing activities we do in the industry, it's, it's, it's certainly not new. But for a long time, those that were engaged really in challenging us were what I would characterize as more some fringe folks. Uh, Joe says they're give me off drugs. I think we probably do need to get him off drugs. Maybe he needs some other help as well. But, uh, <laughs> but and the guy over there in the cowboy hat, I think the cowboy hat may be the only thing that he might even possibly have in common with anybody in this room, frankly. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we saw those folks, and they've been around for a while, but they really didn't have big impacts because they were that. They were sort of the fringe. They're the people we kind of saw and we kind of mm, snickered at and, and, and kind of went on. Well, the reason that this is now more important to us and more in our list of things we need to be aware of in this industry is it's now mainstream. The ideas and the concerns are now different than fringe folks who had some sort of religious or other kind of philosophical thing. There are different dimensions that are showing up around the things we do. The technologies we use in our industry. And it's showing up on Frontline, it's showing up in the Wall Street Journal, it's showing up in Reuters, it's showing up in Bloomberg, it's showing up in the business, and of course it's also resonating in the consumer publications. It's something we need to be quite aware of and we need to think about, okay, what does this mean for us and what are the implications and especially what can we do or should we do about it? We respond and a lot of times we try. We have to. We try to respond in some way. Let's get some facts back on the table. Some of our responses, I think, are probably more, uh, more impactful than some others. Uh, here we say, well, okay, so maybe 80% of the volume of antibiotics are being used. Oh, that was factory farms. I'm not sure where that came from, but that was just another one of the mental pictures they want to paint on the other side. We say, well, wait a minute, let's adjust it for the number of pounds that it's being applied to. And if you add all the human pounds and pets pounds that antibiotics are being used for per pound, they're using more than us. Okay, great. Uh, I, that, that's, you know, we can play with the facts, but let's uh, say no, don't respond in this way, don't get the facts on the table, but I'm not sure how much impact these will have in terms of where we'll actually end up in the industry overall. Why do we use antibiotics? We're going to focus on that one just for a moment here. Um, you know, we, we kind of categorize them into three major buckets, and you could probably put another bucket here, but it, it seems like we use them for treatment for treatment of animals that are ill, and so we can get them back healthy again. And, and, and that's a noble thing to do. Our animal health scientists have shown us we can use these antibiotics effectively and other medications, and we want healthy animals. We want it not only because it's more productive for us and economically sound, we don't like our animals sick. I mean, we have an emotion tied to it, I believe, in this industry. I've seen it. I've lived it. And that's a good thing. We want to maintain that. We use subtherapeutic type for maintenance of animal health. So, in other words, before the bad event occurs, see if we can prevent it. And that's a very engaged use. I mean, it's a use of what we have antibiotics designed for, is preventative kinds of things. And, of course, we use antibiotics and other additives for, for growth enhancement. It's about providing the world with affordable product. These buckets have been well researched, both on the animal production, animal welfare, animal health side, as well as the economics, and the decisions have been very clear. Indeed, as well on the consumer side with food safety, other components. We all know that. It's the life we've lived and we're comfortable with it, but there's some people that may not agree with us 
or may not understand this or may not believe us. So why do we use them? Well, I've mentioned the benefits. It's around cattle health. It's around enhanced production efficiency, being able to produce safe, abundant, affordable food for the world. It enables us to capture economies of scale. Animal health enhancement has enabled us to bring animals together in much more efficient production facilities. That's enabled that kind of a production system, which is very efficient from a lot of different perspectives. It enables us to monitor and manage cattle better. We can co-mingle. We have a cattle industry that, as you know, is quite diverse. It's very decentralized at the cow-calf sector, and we can bring those animals together and put them on the kind of high energy rations and monitor them, commingling because we are able to maintain the animal health with our technology. The technology is a wonderful thing. It enables us to do that. We can deal with the animal stresses better and, and, and maintain some things there. We can deal with uncertainty better by having these insurance activities around animal antibiotics. So it's clearly something that just makes sense to the industry to adopt and use effective and efficient and economically sound practices. We do that all the day, all the time, and it's, and it's made our industry a better place. What are some drawbacks? And there are some, and some of them are elevating. One of the drawbacks, and we see this now, okay, we can lose some efficacy. Some of the drugs might become less effective over time. We worry about that with some more than others because we always say, well, technology will figure out the solution to that. And I usually believe that to be true. I, the production scientist, the medical scientists here at K-State that I work with, I have complete confidence they can figure out the fix. But it's there, and some antibiotics we worry about that much more than others. We know that some of the technologies we adopt affect our meat quality. We've got to be realizing that. We've got to be cognizant of it. It could matter. We adopt a technology for inefficiency, but it might have an influence on what our end consumer receives, and we've got to be aware of that. But the last two are the ones that are starting to raise the storm. And that is, regardless of all the accolades that I believe to be true that I've just described around our use, our judicious use of antibiotics and other technologies, consumers are starting to say more mainstream. We're concerned about this. And to the point where they are bringing our policymakers, our regulators, and others in that arena to the table to start to tell us what we can and can't do or should or shouldn't do. It's increasing scrutiny on us, and there's no doubt about that. It will continue to raise. And it's not only a domestic issue. Paul Clayton, it's an international issue as well. It's one we need to be aware of. And he'll, no doubt, help you understand that a little better as well. The other dimension with this is the nature of the concerns here have elevated to greater scope. Not only are they increasing in their, in, in, in their intensity, the dimensionality of the nature of the issues are raising. It's not just anymore a guy standing in front of Burger King with worry about his beef he is or is not going to eat and how it's been drugged or not drugged in his mind. It has other dimensions that are starting to show up. And the one that really is, I think, elevating some of the national concern surrounds around this, does our use of antibiotics impact in some adverse way human health, and especially humans' ability to use their drugs effectively? And the superbugs kind of thing that's showing up out there. Uh, and, and the issues that people get concerned about resistance, whether it's currently a drug being used in the human field or not, the resistance itself raises some concerns that used to perhaps not be nearly as acute as they are today. 
So we, we've got to understand a little bit. Whether we agree with them or not isn't as important as understanding where are they coming from, what's putting these people in this position. And notice it's not just the fringe. That's the key. It's the mainstream that's there. Now, I, I put this quote up uh, because I, I think it, it illustrates where I think some of the mindset is coming from that we're facing. And not here because I necessarily endorse Center for Food Integrity, but it says science tells us what we can do, and society tells us what we should do. Um, my eight-year-old daughter this morning, when I was walking out the door, she said, Daddy, I heard you have a big presentation today. She also said, and it looks like you must be taking it pretty seriously. I said, yeah, I do. And she said, what, what's it about? I said, well, I'm, I'm talking to the Cattlemen's Day. It, it's, it's my favorite group. Kansas Cattlemen's Day is my absolute favorite event of the year. But I'm kind of nervous, and I'm kind of excited, and I'm going to tell them some things that may or may not make them happy. I don't know. So what's it about? I said, well, I gave her this quote. I said, well, science tells us what we can do, but society sort of tells us what we should do. And she kind of looked a little bit and said, what's that mean? I said, well, you know, let, let's think about this for a moment. Um, you know, Mariah, we could, we could actually, for example, make a clone of you. We could today. We actually have the science available, Mariah, that we could make a clone of you. We could take part of you, a really tiny part, put you in a petri dish somewhere, and somebody really smart, smarter than me, could actually make another Mariah. We could do that. I said, should we? Um, my eight-year-old, she looked at me and kind of got this, wow, dad, that's crazy. She said, uh, no, I don't think so, because something might go wrong and we might not like her as much as we do me. <laughs> I, my only response was, I mean, I loved it, and I said, you know what? I guarantee I can't like her any more than I do you. I mean, that's an easy one, right? So, but it's, it, I mean, that's, that's, that's where we're at. Uh, the supply side we can do, guys. We, we're going to continue to push it, and we need to. You know I'm a big technology guy. If you've heard me ever talk here, you've heard how much I embrace it. I'm not like the normal person in our 311 million population in the U.S., and I ain't even close to the normal person in our 7.2 billion population in the world. Not even close. They don't have the same experience and immersion in this that I have. What do we do? What should we do? Should we stand back and just continue to throw arrows back and forth at one another? Well, we've got some good things. Jason Lust survey, I think it was his January 2004 down at Oklahoma State, the food survey he does, uh, it, it echoed what we already have heard many times and what our research shows as well. People fortunately trust, consumers in the U.S. especially trust the USDA. They trust our Food and Drug Administration. They really do, and they trust our American Medical Association. Those are some places they go for comfort in things they will not understand because they cannot. They don't have the time to invest and understand what our technology is what it really means. So the unknown you fear, or you go to somebody that you trust. Those nodes are important to us. We can leverage them and continue to use them. I know we are. We need to continue to. They're not our enemies, they're our friends, though sometimes we, we might wonder. But the bottom line, we know this. This has long been here. There's no room for screw-ups here. There's no room for individuals making blunders, especially blunders that are out of carelessness in this industry. Because trust is what it's all about. We can't lose that consumer's trust. And if we as an industry don't wrap our arms around this issue and try to ourselves determine how we're going to manage and deal with it, somebody else will regulate it for us. And my own bias is if we let somebody else regulate, generally, we're in a worse position than if we would have been able to propose and demonstrate 
what we're doing so you don't need to be here regulating us. That sounds like a threat, I know. It is a little bit, but I always see these as wonderful opportunities. That's just my nature. And so I do really see this one as posing an opportunity for the industry. Why? How? Remember, it's about trust. It's about a commitment to that. That's what we're actually trying to do. We're trying to help our consumers trust us and want our product and believe that it's the best, safest in the world. But to do that, we're going to have to get a little more proactive. How many of you, don't show your hands, but just think about it. How many actually have a written protocol for your own production practice in your operation? Why written? Well, somebody comes around and says, how do you do this? I say, well, here, this is how we do it. It's been certified. USDA, FDA both say these are the practices that should be used. The American Veterinary Medical Association says this is the right way. We adopted the practices based on our scientific community and the Food and Drug Administration. The consumer's watchdog says it's the right way to do it and we're doing it. Think about it. I know, it's work. Oh, geez, let me go about and do my life. I enjoy the cows. I don't enjoy writing papers. But think about what it does for documenting and demonstrating. Certifications, audits, traceability. We need more vertical information flow in this industry, not less. It seems like we so often in this industry do something and we don't want to tell somebody else about it, especially the person we're selling these animals to. We hide it from them. No, that doesn't work. That doesn't work in the industry. It's a great opportunity here for us to get together and elevate our information transmission and elevate the formality with which we deal with some of these issues. Defensiveness doesn't work, we know that. Scientific and economic jargon, I know. My economic jargon doesn't resonate. Not with the 7.2 billion I'm talking about around the world, let alone the 311 million here. Demonstrate we're sincere, and then we promote it. If we say, look what we've done, we've taken a new initiative in this industry, and we're going to tackle this issue head on because we believe in our industry and we believe in our global consumer, well, think about it, whether you agree with it or not. It's our opportunity. Let's think about everything we do. What would these people think? And we don't need them to understand every nuance of our technology. They don't really want to. They just want to be able to trust us, and we need to give them every reason to. And I think we need to give an elevated formality to that reason myself. So something to think about as you go forward. We'll open for a few minutes here of questions. Uh, so we appreciate your coming here. And as I said, this is my favorite day of the year, Cattleman's Day. So I hope you enjoy the conference. Glenn now will tell you where the crystal ball is going, so ask away. <laughs> Thank you. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll try to get the microphone up to you, um, and so that way the audience out in the arena can hear you as well. I don't know if this is appropriate for this thing or not, but I was reading an article on the internet the other day about uh, wanting to import this beef from Brazil, where they, uh, where they still have issues with hoof and mouth disease. Kind of curious of what your take on that is. Yeah, I'll, I'll start, and Glenn probably has some comments as well. You know, from a broader perspective, we, we need a high level of biosecurity in this country. There is no doubt about it. And it needs to be higher than what I grew up around. And, and it's not out of necessarily the fact we've got to be paranoid, because I'm, I'm certainly not that. It's out of just making sure we've got systems in place so if events occur, whether it's an animal disease outbreak or whether it's a biosecurity issue associated with some external threat from somebody, that we just, we just elevate a little bit. We're a little more aware. We have systems in place to manage that a little better. Part of that surveillance means products moving in and out. 
How, let's not get lax. Let's not suddenly let something come in here that comes in easier because we've let down our biosecurity surveillance system on a, a broader scale. You'll notice that the specific Brazil, Brazilian import issue that, that he's mentioning has already been delayed 60 days. In other words, the comment period for providing knowledge and idea and, and sentiment on that has been delayed. And the reason for that is, is because we have realized not, you know, so, some have said, wait, we need to evaluate this a little better. We need to make sure we're comfortable because we do know that parts of Brazil have had sort of ongoing foot and mouth disease outbreaks. And we do know that their cattle even have a higher uh, tolerance level because of those outbreaks. We're quite susceptible. We haven't had the disease here for a long, long time to the point where our cattle are susceptible if such a contagious event were to come in. Um, so I think it's a wise thing to sit back and take some time and think about it. Now, do I have the answer of should we or shouldn't we? No, I really don't because I don't fully grasp the entire scientific risk here. I think those that do are the ones we need to rely on. Those that are monitoring and understand it and can quantify it, nothing's without risk. If we want to say we're not going to allow anything to happen, zero tolerance, we close our borders to everything and everybody and we don't travel out and nobody comes in and we know we cannot accept that. There are certain risks we're going to have to face, but we've got to monitor them. We've got to monitor them and see where they're at. And you know what? Just because we let something in, if we were, that doesn't mean you let your guard down and, and, and you don't keep surveillance so that if you have to chop it off in a hurry, you can. I mean, that's true with all the countries of the world. So I'll, I'll let Glenn add I would that. agree with everything Ted said, but I would also put in the word of caution. Um, it certainly isn't a yes, no, black, white issue. Um, there's a lot of things to think about, and one of them I'll muddy up in everybody's head is, and Mr. Clayton knows this better than I do, so he can speak to this in a minute, but, you know, international trade is, you know, bargaining on buckets of goods between countries. And you got to be very careful not to send the wrong signal in the international world, right, even if it is justified from a biosecurity perspective, which I don't know if it is or not. I'm not the biosecurity expert, right? We've got to have all the discussion assessment that Ted noted, but you also have to recognize the political signals that come with what at times could come across as pure protectionistic signaling. I'm not sure we always do ourselves justice when we send that signal. And that's not unique to the current Brazil discussion. There's lots of those. So I would encourage everybody to pause, uh, think through multiple dimensions, including the biosecurity part, before you react. Are there any more questions? Uh, Glenn, my question would be, uh, if you look at the, uh, if, I, if I understood your forecasted uh, growth in cow numbers, I think it was 16% over 10 years. Uh, when would you anticipate within that 10 years, and if you do, when would you anticipate a supply-driven downturn in the market? Well, you, you took demand off the table in your question, right? But, but I understand the point, right? At what point do we ex effectively expand the calf crop to where we reduce the current supply support for historically high prices? I think that's what you're getting at. Um, those numbers that USDA puts out, the largest herd expansion is still three years away from now, right? It takes a while in a percentage year over year since to expand the herd. So we're three or four years away from what you might call a real, right, increase in the calf crop. I note that because we're probably two or three years away from a real supply improvement in terms of, you know, improving our volume flows. Um, but I'm very hesitant to say that alone will do it. A, I don't think demand will stay flat, right? I think that'll be changing the whole time domestically and abroad. But perhaps more importantly is in the meantime, when we have tight supplies, you know, I have the whole excess capacity thing up there for a reason. I don't think the feedlot sector, the processing sector, whatever, will just sit around and wait for more animals and carcasses to come in. And that could totally change the supply demand relationships over the next 10 years, right? So I'm very hesitant to give you it'll happen in 2017 answer. The numbers that USDA put out is we're three or four years away from a real increase in the calf crop. So I think it's probably that long. But even then, that may not be sufficient to remove, right, the core supply is tight fundamentals that are currently at play in the industry. So 
I half answered your question and tried to give you more because I think there'll be more things changing as well. It's at least three years. I like confidence intervals instead of precise numbers. Yeah. Now, I have to kind of put out a guilt trip and then we'll step down, but Ted and I made a targeted effort to be concise to get more questions. So if there's something burning on your heart, please ask us.